بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك وأتوجه إليك بنبيك نبي الرحمة محمد صلى الله عليه وآله يا أبا القاسم يا رسول الله يا إمام الرحمة يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها فعلنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا أمير المؤمنين يا علي بن أبي طالب يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إمنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها اشفع لنا عند الله يا فاطمة الزهراء يا بنت محمد يا قرة عين الرسول يا سيدتنا ومولاتنا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيهة عند الله اشفعي لنا عند الله يا أبا محمد يا حسن بن علي أيها المجتبى يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه 
يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا عبد الله حسين ابن علي أيها الشهيد يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا الحسن يا علي بن الحسين يا زين العابدين يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا جعفر يا محمد بن علي أيها الباقر يا ابن رسول الله حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا أبا عبد الله يا جعفر بن محمد أيها الصادق يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا 
يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الحسن يا موسى بن جعفر أيها الكاظم يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها اشفع لنا عند الله يا ابا الحسن يا علي بن موسى ايها الرضا يا ابن رسول الله حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند يا محمد بن علي أيها التقي الجواد يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه يا سيدنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند اشفع لنا عند الله يا ابا الحسن يا علي بن محمد ايها العاد النقي يا ابن رسول الله يا 
حجت اللہ علی خلقے یا سیدنا و مولانا انا توجہنا و استشفانا و توسلنا بکا الاللہ و قدمنا کا بین یدی حاجاتنا یا وجیہن عند اللہ اشفع لنا عند اللہ یا ابا محمد یا حسن ابن علی ایوہ الزکی العسکری یا ابن رسول اللہ یا حجت اللہ علی خلقی یا سیدنا و مولانا انا توجہنا و استشفعنا و توسلنا بکا الاللہ و قدمنا کا بین یدائی حاجاتنا یا وجیہن عند اللہ اشفع لنا عند الحسن والخلف والحجة أيها القائم المنتظر المهدي يا ابن رسول الله يا حجة الله على خلقه یا سیدنا و مولانا انا توجہنا و استشفعنا و توسلنا بکا الاللہ و قدمنا کا یا وجیہن عند اللہ اشبع لنا عند اللہ یا وجیہن عند اللہ اشبع لنا جیہن عند اللہ اشفع لنا عند اللہ یا سادتی و موالی انی توجہت بکم ائمتی و عدتی لیومی فقری و حاجتی الاللہ و توسلت بکم الاللہ و استشفعت بکم الاللہ فاشفعو لی عند اللہ و استنقذو لی من ذنوبی عند اللہ فإنکم وسیلتی الاللہ و 
وبحبكم وبقربكم أرجو نجاة من الله فكونوا عند الله رجائي يا سادتي الله عليهم مجمعين ولعن الله أعداء الله ظالميهم من الأولين والآخرين آمين رب العالمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'd like to talk about a subject that is debated and discussed across the board something that a lot of people are interested in and it's the topic of success and I don't mean success in the sense that you make a life for yourself buy a nice little house with white picket fence and have a family of your own get a job work nine to five earn a living all of which are manifestations of a certain interpretation of success. And that's all well and good. I'm talking about true success, real, lasting success that brings you true happiness. Today, we mark the martyrdom of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim May God's peace and blessings be upon him. And when we commemorate an event related to Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, it could be an incredible turning point in our lives. If we ponder on the story of Imam al kadhim it could present an opportunity for us to achieve that lasting meaningful success both in this world as well as the next and that's what I want to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy Quran and I quote they wish they want they have willed to extinguish the light of God with their mouths, with their utterings. They have made a conscious and deliberate decision to eradicate the light of God, to eradicate and obliterate guidance that has come from the direction of the divine. Now what does that mean? I'd like to talk a little bit about this. When God says yuridun, which means they have willed, they have decided to, what He's talking about is a consistent and persistent effort. Not just wishes, not just desires. It's not that they, and by they we mean the enemies of God, it's not that they have these deep-seated desires to see God's guidance being eradicated. No, they are persistent. They have put in the effort. They have brought the cavalry. They have put in the money, the wealth, the political backing, whatever it takes. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ and so from day one, my dear brothers and sisters, when the Holy Messenger of God descended from 
the mountaintop, from the cave in which he dwelled, in which he prayed to God and worshipped the Almighty Lord. When the Prophet came out of that cave and said to the people that I am announcing my prophetic message, I'm here to tell you that there is an afterlife. I'm here to tell you that this life is only transient. I'm here to deliver messages from God that you need to uphold virtue, you need to be good moral people, you need to obey guidance of the Lord so that, that, so that you could achieve victory, so that you could be successful. When he announced his prophetic message and mission from day one, what was their reaction? They started throwing pebbles and stones and rocks in his direction. Give him a chance. Listen to what he has to say. Give yourselves a chance. Whether his message is one that is worthy of being listened to, of being adhered to, give yourself a chance. Not a moment of hesitation. They started to shower him with those rocks, causing him to bleed from head to toe. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ A preemptive strike against anyone that declares virtue and morality and ethics and goodness and kindness and compassion is the road that we should all take. Preemptive strike. Strike them down. Because we have interests. Because they had interests that they needed to guard. And those interests could only be guarded if the light of God was extinguished. The commander of the faithful sums up those early years of the prophetic message and the delivery of the holy messenger's words to the people by saying this. He says, Inni ma ra'aytu rakha'a. I never saw a moment of relief or rest. إِنِّي مَا رَأَيْتُ رَخَاءً خِفْتُ صَغِيرًا وَجَاهَدْتُ كَبِيرًا I was always in the state of fear when I was a child. And when I grew older, when I was able to defend the Prophet and his message, that's all I did. All I did was spend my years of youth and adulthood in Wars trying to defend the Messenger of God. And so as a result of that, the Prophet and his tiny community of devotees and believers were forced into becoming refugees, literally. They were forced out of their native city of Mecca by the Quraysh, and so they left. They left everything behind their livelihoods, their homes. In many cases, their families, their children. They left everything behind and they became refugees, migrated to Medina. Was that the end of the story? Absolutely not. Did they leave them alone? Absolutely not. Did they give them a, a chance to live away from their native city and make a living for themselves? Absolutely not. It was war after war, ambush after ambush, conquest after conquest, a never-ending cycle of violence waged against the Holy Prophet and Islam. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ Notice by the way how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and for those of you who are more familiar with the Arabic language and Arabic grammar, God says, يُرِيدُونَ They have willed لِيُطْفِئُوا This lam before the word يُطْفِئُوا meaning extinguish, also means that persistent, insistent, unrelenting effort to try and obliterate the light of God. Decades of pain and suffering were inflicted on the Prophet and his family and their community of followers. Centuries of persecution had to be endured because 
the enemy because the other side is unrelenting. Because the other side is not willing to give up. Until they see the light of God completely extinguished and obliterated, they would not rest for a moment. Which is why Amir al-Mu'mineen says, مَن نَامَ لَمْ يُنَمْ If you're asleep, if you are negligent of the danger that lurks behind the corner, your enemy is never asleep. If you happen to be neglectful, your enemy is never neglectful. Your enemy is always wide awake, plotting and scheming and trying to destroy you. Fatima al-Zahra thus describes her predicament and that of her fathers and husbands and children. She says, صُبَّتْ عَلَيَّ مَصَائِبٌ لَوْ أَنَّهَا صُبَّتْ عَلَى الْأَيَّامِ صَرْنَ لَيَالِيَ They have brought down upon us such tragedies and such afflictions that if these tragedies and afflictions were sent upon daylight, it would turn into utter darkness, into pitch black night. And she's not being hyperbolic. This is Fatima to Zahra we're talking about. She's not being poetic. She's speaking in literal terms that they tried to do to us what the worst and most mortal enemy would do to his enemy. And so you'll notice that the difference in circumstances of each imam was not because times were changing, but because the methods and tactics and strategies had to be changed, right? So for example, they treated Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful, in a manner that was unique perhaps to the other imams. They forced him into house arrest for 25 years, a quarter of a century no less. Then they waged three destructive wars against the imam and eventually they assassinated him. Then when it came time to Imam al-Hasan, his son, Imam al-Hasan, their strategy was that they would uh, 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 create a vacuum under his feet by taking away his base, by luring his base or threatening or extorting the people around him, his inner circle, as well as the larger community. They would devoid Imam al-Hasan from public support and leave him all alone. And eventually, they poisoned him and assassinated him. Then came time for Imam al-Hussein. And what they did to him was something they had never done to anybody else before or after. They would slaughter him and his entire family and children in broad daylight. But then they realized that none of those tactics worked. But on top, on top of that, Imam al-Hussein, there was a massive backlash. And the backlash reverberated to the point where the Umayyad regime would collapse within a short period of time. And so they had to devise a new plan. They had to hatch a new scheme. They had to change their strategy. And so with each subsequent Imam, they did something slightly different, but with similar results. They would kill the Imam, they would sever the Imam's connection to his community, but the Imam's light and guidance would continue to shine brightly as the sun. And so they kept changing their strategies. But by far, mark my words brothers and sisters, one of the darkest epics and eras was that of Harun, the one known as Rashid. Harun al-Abbasi employed the total sum of the strategies and schemes and plots of his predecessors in the worst possible manner. He treated the Imam of his time, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam whose commemoration we are honoring today, in the harshest possible manner. What did he do? In Arabic it's called Tamura. In English, the closest term to that is dungeon. But I think people probably don't appreciate what a dungeon actually is. So you have a fortress, 
a military complex, a compound that has the strictest security apparatus employed to ensure there is no one coming in or out. That fortress often has a basement. In the basement, they dig a hole into a cellar. Inside the cellar, they dig a well. At the very bottom of that well, they create a tiny room. That room is called a dungeon. Do you realize what we're talking about, what we're dealing with here, brothers and sisters? Inside that dungeon, there is hardly any oxygen to breathe anymore. There is zero light coming in. It is a grave for the living or just barely living. Which is why our Imam could not breathe unless he climbed up the narrow walls of that well which represented a coffin. He had to climb all the way up to the hatch just to be able to catch a few breaths of air. And even when he did that, a Sindhi ibn Shahik, his warden, or other wardens that were guarding the Imam in the dungeon, he would come to the hatch, wait for the Imam to climb up so that he could catch a few breaths of air. And when the Imam reached the hatch, he would slap the Imam across his face and curse his mother Fatima to Zahra. That was where Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was imprisoned by Harun. And not for a day, which would pass as slowly as an entire year. And not for a week, not for a month, but for over a decade, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far had to endure that kind of imprisonment. One of the darkest eras was that of Harun. And yet now you have people who are trying to reconstruct and re, re, through revisionist history, so to speak, portray that era as a golden era of Islamic knowledge. All it was, was a dark time of repression, of injustice, and of utter ignorance. The only achievement of Harun during that time was that he took Western books of philosophy and logic and sometimes medicine and he translated those into Arabic in an effort to obfuscate and take over the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. May God's peace and blessings be upon them. The idea was that by introducing Western philosophy into the Muslim world, he would create an alternative to the Ahlul Bayt. He would create a different path for those trying to seek knowledge instead of going toward the direction of God's light, the Ahlul Bayt, God's blessings, blessings be upon them. He would present them with something that was antithetical to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, which is the origin of so-called Islamic philosophy, which is basically Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, repackaged and rebranded as though it has an Islamic flavor. That is literally the only thing Harun did. And yet he's called the king of the golden era of Islamic history. By repressing the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the descendants of Rasulullah, the way he, di he did with Imam al kazim alayhi salam. Now, this is what a dungeon is. However, I said in the verse that I started the talk with, Allah. We know what they have done in order to extinguish the light of God, but let's look at the other side of the formula. But God, they may have a plan, they may scheme, they may plot, but God has a plan of His own. The Creator of the universe has a scheme 
that he has put into play as well. Now, who do you think is going to win when these two sides clash? Wallahu mutimmu nurihi. Harun used to look up the sky. He had the kind of kingdom and the kind of dominion that he was probably the only person throughout history who could look up at the sky, address the clouds, and say, Amtiri haythuma shi'ti. You can go and drop your rain wherever you want. Fakharajuki ilay. But worry not, because the taxes from the wealth that is procured through the rain that falls on the earth and grows the crops, the taxes will end up in my hands. You could go wherever you want. I will be the one collecting your taxes. Meaning that his domain was so massive, his kingdom was so expansive, that he really felt like the king of the world. He felt like he would rule for as long as possible and then his children would come along and then his descendants would rule for eternity. That was his plan. But then there was God's plan. The one imprisoned in the dungeon also had a plan of his own. Where is Harun today, brothers and sisters? Where is the dominion and kingdom of Harun? Where is his wealth? Where is his pomposity? Where is his army? Where are his guards? Where are his palaces? Where are they all? I can tell you where the other side is. All you have to do is take a look at the majestic mausoleum of Musa ibn Ja'far in Kazimain. I can tell you that the prisoner who was left in the dungeon unable to breathe and was eventually poisoned to death, I can tell you where his grave is. I can tell you that he now controls and is in charge of the hearts of hundreds of millions of people around the world. I can tell you that people are willing to die to defend his shrine. Not himself, but the mausoleum and the complex that houses his shrine. That is where Musa ibn Ja'far is. Three places in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the same sentence. Listen carefully. Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ God is the one who sent his prophet with guidance and the religion of truth. The difference between this scheme that the evildoers have hatched and the the plan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his vicegerents have had is that this is the truth that is utter falsehood. So that this religion could become dominant. So that God's system of morals and virtues could be the one that ends up being in charge. The morals of God, the teachings of God, God's religion, from which all divine religions have stemmed and concluded with the religion of Islam, will be the one to have the final word, not those of the evildoers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse in the Quran, He says, Inna lanansuru rusulana. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْأَشْهَادِ We shall grant victory and support to our messengers as well as the believers. Not just the prophets of God receive His backing, but also any believer, you can receive the backing of God in a similar fashion. He says, we shall give victory to the prophets as well as the believers in this world. And on the day the witnesses rise. Not just in the afterlife, but also in this world. And the love and the sheer devotion that people have toward the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt that we see manifested today in pilgrimages that encompass millions upon millions of people is only one manifestation of God's backing and support and victory in this world to those who are good, not just in the afterlife. The calculations of Harun were 
calculations that, that he put a lot of effort into. He was a genius, a political genius. Someone who could hatch all these schemes to build an empire like this. But the problem is that those calculations are offset and they are cancelled out by another set of calculations, overriding the calculations of Harun. It's sort of like uh, classical physics versus quantum physics. Newtonian physics, or what's often referred to as classical physics, they may work in a certain environment. They work on a macro scale. They work on the scale of stars and planets and galaxies and whatnot. But then, you need a new set of calculations. You need a new set of mechanics and physics called quantum physics that will take over in a certain environment. Now, in the grand scheme of things, in the sense of this world and this life and the afterlife, the mechanics of Harun and the mechanics of these evil tyrants simply fall apart. They don't work. They might be able to get them a kingdom and a little bit of wealth and money and power and influence within a short span of time. But that influence will disappear once God's mechanics and God's calculations and God's equations come into play. Once you talk about the bigger picture, it's God's word and no one else's. There is a paradigm shift as they say, which is why. If you follow the equations of God and His prophets and apostles, you will also prosper. It doesn't have to be a prophet, like I said. You can prosper. You can achieve success in this life as well as the next. True, meaningful happiness can only come through God and His apostles. Man rakiba ghayra safinatana gharaq, as the Imams say. If you board another ship, you will drown. If you try to take a shortcut, you will lose. If you don't follow the teachings of the Prophet and the Imams and God's Apostles, you will not achieve success. Man, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ halak, As we say in Ziyaratul Jama'ah. Whoever does not go back to the Imams and doesn't follow their guidance will perish. No questions about it, no ifs, no buts. True success is achieved only by obedience to God and the fellowship of His Prophets and the Ahlul Bayt. You look at someone like the Kardashians and their lives, people are obsessed with them, right? They have a wedding that is so lavish, it's fantastical. There's a word for it in pop culture. They say magical, magical wedding. But is it really magical though? Is the end result something that they desire to have? If you're looking at lavish weddings, let me tell you about a wedding that was a thousand times more lavish than the Kardashians. It was the wedding of Harun and his wife Zubaydah, commonly referred to as Sit Zubaydah. Harun married Zubaydah and the wedding was so extravagant. It was so exuberant. It was so big. It was so... It was a royal wedding to the nth degree, taken all the way to its maximum possible potential. To the extent, I'll just mention one example, Zubayda had a thousand bridesmaids, a thousand flower girls, a thousand women who simply carried her train, meaning the tail of her wedding gown, a thousand. Talk about a royal wedding, talk about a magical wedding. Where is all that? What happened? What happened to the wedding? What happened to the happiness that they exhibited? What happened to their palaces? What happened to the food? What happened to the extravagance? Where is it all? Seriously. None of it remains. They ended up becoming a footnote in the annals of history books and nothing more. But where is Musa ibn Ja'far? Where is the prisoner thrown inside a dungeon? The whole world, all of us, are none but slaves to that master, Musa ibn Ja'far. It gives me goosebumps just mentioning his names. 
the love, the devotion that we have towards the Imam is indescribable. Just watch images of the millions upon millions of people who are marching towards his shrine as we speak. Where is Harun? Where is Musa ibn Jafar? The kingdom of the Imam spans the universe today. Whereas his enemies are rotting in hell. May Allah bless you. May Allah give us the backing, the support to follow in the footsteps of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam And may he grant us the intercession of the Imam on the day of judgment as well as his visitation in this world. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.